Welcome to the show, uh, members. This is uh, QFS podcast number two. We have a very special guest with us internationally based in Dubai. Can I have the gentleman talking to me represent himself? Hey, what's up? Uh, this is Uzair Merchant. How is everybody doing? All right, Mr. Uzair. Well, welcome to the show. And first of all, from my understanding, you have worked on some of Hollywood's biggest productions. Can you tell us what your your portfolio looks like? Yeah, sure. First of all, thanks, uh, Tarek, for having me around here. Uh, it was really nice for you to get in touch. Uh, so, well, I've kind of worked and lived all over, uh, grew up in Dubai, right? Uh, but some of the biggest films that uh, I've been part of were most recently Star Trek Beyond. Uh, before that, That's amazing. Was... <laughs> yeah, thanks. It was pretty awesome. Uh, before that was uh, Fast and Furious 7. Nice. Very um, cool. And then I, I was lucky enough to have uh, interned on Skyfall in London. Okay, great. Um, can you give us a little brief history on your experience, your education, how you were able to find yourself in the film industry? And was film something that you always hoped to pursue? So, well, basically, I was always involved in design, right? Um, since since the very beginning, since as far as I can remember. Um, so design was always on the books. Um, so you're an art director, correct? That is correct, yeah. I am, I am an art director. Um, and I ended up studying it in, in university. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I studied was production design for film and TV. Okay. Um, this was at the Nottingham Trent University in, in England. And uh, that gave me a very good understanding of, of the film side within the art department. Right? Okay. So what goes on within an art department and within each production, be it feature film, be it mm -hmm. TV, be it commercial, right? Right. Um, and then once I started understanding that, uh, it just made me want to make films more. It actually made me realize that I wanted to make films more. But to, to get to there, um, it was about understanding the, the art department side even better. Right. And the thing is, what many people don't realize is if you can understand the whole process of the art department, mm -hmm. you can actually make a film because you're doing everything from conceptualizing mm -hmm. to drawing camera angles to what yeah, it looks like. You have to have a, um, you have to have a good understanding of color palette, space, you know, how to convey a message within, you know, cause film is a very specific type of medium and you always have to correspond your colors to the type of camera that's being used, to the type of vision that the director has. Now, yeah, but even even besides colors, it's even uh, even understanding structure. Okay. You know, um, different shots angled differently can mean different things. Mm -hmm. You know, a shot Definitely. that's angled from the floor looking up can empower a character right. rather than a shot set up from the top looking down, and that comes in from a storyboard. Of that course. comes out of the art department. Of so course. if I know it, if I'm setting up that shot in my storyboard on paper, uh, and if I can convey it, my DOP can set up that camera exactly like that and okay. film it, you know. Uh, but then eventually that that whole art department production design side uh, helped me understand, like I said, that side more. So I ended up moving back to the Post University, um, worked on a lot of commercials here worked on some TV series here, and then uh, ended up going to New York Film Academy. Okay. How was that experience? Uh, dude, it was brilliant. Uh, learning learning how to film on traditional film in okay. New York. Super 35. Uh, 35 and 16 both. Nice. Very nice. But more more 16. Yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome. And uh, that actually gave me some technical knowledge of, of film, which I had not experienced before. Okay. Uh, and it's the stuff that you may not learn on a set. Sure. Uh, but it's the it's the it's the little nitty gritty details, mm -hmm. of, you know. Okay, this is this is you know the way to do this, and there might be five or ten other ways to do it. You know, there's right. always other ways to do things. There's no right way of doing something in this industry. Correct. But unfortunately, there are some wrong things. Okay. You know, like crossing the line, for example. Of uh, course, the 180 degree rule. Yeah, but that doesn't mean to say people haven't done it, right? They've done it. You know, you, you've had you've had directors to play with that. And the thing is, they've always pushed those lines. But still knowing that that is something to be, you know, thinking about, mm -hmm. uh, that was really cool that I got to learn in, 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 
in New York, and it was just uh, understanding a different side of film. Okay. Have yeah. you always been a cinephile growing up? Has film been an essential part of your childhood? Have has it been? Was it a new discovery for you, or? It was it was the biggest part while growing up. That's amazing. Uh, okay. sneak, s- sneaking my little iPod mm-hmm. in, into into my school uh, to watch films is you know, uh, yeah, it's always been film or, or TV or, but there's always been that visual you know representation. It actually started out with, uh, well, my dad. He's a, he's a he's a crazy film buff. Okay. He loves films. Yeah, yeah. So but it's he runs loves- in the family then. It actually does. It's so funny though because I get fifty fifty from each of my parents. Okay. My dad's my dad's a designer and my mom used to model back in the day, right? Okay. Uh so they one side comes from a production side, one side comes from a design side, and it got exactly half of each. And Excellent. it's funny because I keep I keep telling my mom that as well. I was born I was on a film set before I was even born. Okay. So, uh, which is actually, it, it's true. It's not like something I made up. Right. Uh, when my mom was going to have me, she was actually modeling. She was on a set. Okay. So I was literally on a set. So you were born right in Hollywood, basically. You were made for the industry. I was born to do this. I, I was born to make film. I would not say I was born to do Hollywood or, or Bollywood. Or okay. I don't, like, I don't like segregating cinema for, for uh, genres or mediums or language. Because mm-hmm. that takes the whole content or purpose of cinema out of its of original course. context, right? Completely agree. The minute, the minute you say, oh, this language, it's not about the language. It's about what you're seeing and understanding from it. Mm-hmm. And you can watch a movie that you don't understand. Okay. And take a lot from it rather than watch a movie that you completely understand and not get it. True, true, very true. Now, let me ask you, um, you've also produced some of your own films, correct? You've also directed a lot of your own pictures. Can you tell us a little bit more on the process of that? What was your most favorite part? What was the most difficult? Some technical challenges. Yeah, so uh, I made the, I've made a few shorts. I made commercials. I'm actually directing more nowadays. Um, and, you know, made that transition slowly. Uh, you know, it's always difficult. Uh, and, but the thing is, every production will kind of teach you something. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've actually been working on a feature film of mine for the last six and a half years. Okay. Uh, It started out while I was in university. Um, And, you know, it's like my little dream baby project. And it's just been growing and growing and growing. Uh, We've had, we've had, you know, I've had people talk to me about it, people who are interested to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's the feature film side. Uh, But before all of that, it was, you know, starting out with the short film. Of course. And uh, it was one of my tutors in university. Um, his name's Hugh Feather. And he actually encouraged me to, to you know, go ahead. And he was like, you want a camera? And just take a camera. Go out and mm-hmm. film it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, but I don't know. He's like, just go. Go out and film. You know, just, right. what's the worst that's going to happen? Right? Sure. Um, and it actually started out with that. So uh, I made my first short film called In Between Lines, uh, which is a pretty crazy concept when I still think back today it's actually one of my favorite things that I did not visually though but for what it is mm-hmm. uh, it'll always be one of my favorite pieces because it was a short film comparing roads to people okay. and it's almost like uh, like visual poetry and uh, I kind of wrote that script over a year just for five minutes it was a five minute short but you know there's okay. a lot of time that went into it and that went on to uh, premiere at a film festival in America mm-hmm called Imago Film Festival, was a finalist there. Familiar with it. And then it uh, went to a festival in London called Prime Cuts, and it won at Prime Cuts, Mm -hmm. uh, won Best Video Piece, and then screened at Rain Dance in London. Oh, nice. Very nice. Now, let me ask you, um, for students within Qatar's specific industry, now my understanding is that you have worked in our industry in particular. Yep. Um, what suggestions can you give to aspiring filmmakers, students that want to go to film school? Do you suggest it? Do you say that, hey, first get out, go to the industry, get some experience under your belt? Or do you jump right in? Oh, man. And you know, it's, it's a difficult one uh, because they both complement each other. Okay. There's some stuff that you cannot learn mm-hmm. in film school and there's some stuff you cannot learn in the field. Okay. Um, but however, I would say, I think in being part of the industry is more important. Okay. Uh, and the only reason is this, no one is going to ask you what was, you know, your scores 
last job. Or what did what was your degree? They might ask you the only question, what's your last job? Right. Who did you right. work with and what did you produce? Who did you work with? What is your last piece of work? Okay. And that piece of paper is not something for other people, okay. but rather more for you. Of course. Uh, whereas in other industries, it's like, you know, oh, I, you know, you went to MIT or you went to Harvard or whatever. Of course. And that gets you your job. It has a lot more weight than based exactly. upon your actual technical skills and proven experience. I mean, exactly. You, you look at directors like Quentin Tarantino, right? Mm -hmm. you, there's a fam very famous saying of his. It's like, I didn't go to film school, I went to films. And that tells you a lot. Great example. The man, yeah, the man studied film mm -hmm. for film. He, no one gave him a paper for it. Sure. However, like I said, it is worth going to it because it's a nice pathway. Okay. Uh, it's... It's, it's better for people to do that if they're still in a 50-50 mindset of, is that what I want to do? Right, right. Because then you get to do different things within that. You know, you'll do the, the writing and the directing and mm -hmm. you'll do bits of it. And you'll be forced into certain circumstances that are not normally dictated or working under pressure is a great example that that environment is still... Working, exactly. And working, doing many things on on a single set. right. You know, you might have to be a gaffer one day, you might have to be the DOP one day, you might. And so you understand in that situation what it goes through. But mm -hmm. it's a very small scale. Okay. The best part for me for go to, to go to film school mm -hmm. was meeting the people around me. Okay, great networking capabilities. and Yeah, not only that, you never know, by the way, from those people that you meet who tomorrow is going to be sure. where. Right. Very true. But it's uh, for me, it was also the idea of meeting different people. So in New York, in, in, film, in the film academy, we had someone from every country like I, it was completely international right so you had someone from argentina you i had friends from like russia and each one came in with some kind of small background right Something you're all passionate like, about the same and you're all talking film exactly that's, you're all talking the same me, language yeah for me that's the best thing we're sitting down after a shoot and each one is talking about a film right. and some of them seen it some of them has not seen it and then mm -hmm. we're sharing each other and that for me was amazing. That's something you will not get on the set. Okay. You will in terms of okay, you know, but not like that. Not not the quality time that you're going to be spending because you're in that group. You're dealing with the same seven or eight people for like mm -hmm. you know two months or whatever. Right. And so you actually you actually learn so much off each other or learn to push each other so much more. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of that, that's good. But if someone wants to make film. Mm -hmm. The first thing I would ask them is, what do you want to do in film? Right. Is it for you or is it for an audience? Yeah, but it's not even that. It's what what part of that film do you want to do? Okay. You can't do everything. If people think that they can make, you can do everything within a film, mm -hmm. it's the biggest mistake, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's the biggest form of collaboration. Of course. So what part of that do you want to do? Do you want to direct it? Do you want to be this, you know, the DOP on it? Do you mm -hmm. want to be the designer on it? Do you want to actually make the sets on it? Do you want to design costume on it? Do you want to be the makeup artist or do special effects? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to blow things up? Do you want to do st what part of film do you want to do? Right. You have you and, have to kind of focus your attention to one specific area because obviously film incorporates a, a really broad spectrum of talents and experience. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what drove you in particular to art direction and how you were able to really refine your skill set within that specific focus? So, like I said, design was always the biggest part of me, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was always there. So I always knew it's going to be something in design. Um, art direction gave me the opportunity to live within the past, present, and future all at the same time. Okay. Right. Um, I can be designing something not for commercial, mm -hmm. not not for it to be in a store or a mall or an office, but right. something for it to be in the second century or <laughs> in the future or exactly. you know somewhere in Africa and Australia at the same time, right? Within a single set, and to me that you know it gives you so much creative space. Mm -hmm. I loved it, uh, and you know talking about developing skills, they. Th that's the best thing that my university did actually mm -hmm. they they didn't teach us skills okay they, they helped us teach ourselves skills uh, okay so they they enabled you basically to learn yeah so we always had people that huh? were there we, we you know to to talk to we had industry people coming in to discuss projects out right uh 
and and so you're dealing with people who are in the industry, production designers, mm-hmm. you know, like Stephen Scott and Andrew Bennett. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we had a chance to talk to them, explain our project, and they're, they're going to question us in real life situations. And even our tutors who are there, they're still currently in the industry, so they're also doing stuff. So mm-hmm. you're dealing with people who are going to throw the real thing at you. And then they'll say, okay, go ahead and solve it. Find a way to solve it. And if you can't, they might give you, you know, you know, they'll, they'll help you come up with a way to solve it. But uh, Do you receive that, a lot of criticism? Does criticism benefit you, or is it more of a collaborative force that they enable you more than they criticize you? Lots of criticism. Okay. Is that, I, do you appreciate criticism as a good thing, or is it? There's no other way, is it? It's right. because, you know, the kind of industry we're part of, if you're not going to appreciate criticism, mm-hmm. then who, who are you doing it for? True. Keep in mind, the film films are for people, right? Of course. And you can't please everybody. So uh, if you're not going to be open to it, mm-hmm. this is not a nine-to-five job. This of is course. for people. That means people are going to have views and comments. And, right, right. And, you, know, you, you learn how to accept some, and the ones that you don't want to accept, you don't accept. It's as simple true, as that. Very true. Now let me ask you, um, after your university, how were you able to find yourself on such big-scale, well-known productions such as your first internship, which I believe is Skyfall? I did that while I was in uni. While you were in uni. Can you tell us a little bit more how you were able to get attached to that project and what type of experiences did you have while working on that project? Uh, That actually came through my university. So uh, we had we had slots that we had to apply for. Okay. Um, And we basically had to go through interview stages Mm -hmm. and 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 then get picked for it. It was as simple as that. Okay. And uh, it was it was uh, it was interview questions that a lot of people were confused. Okay. But literally, one of the questions was, if you were asked to make tea and coffee when mm-hmm. you go there, what would you say? Mm-hmm. I mean, I know some people refused. Sure. Uh, I said, how much tea, how much sugar? And, you know, you go ahead and you do your job. That's your job. Basically, while you're start from whatever element you can, right? Yeah, you have to start at the bottom. Of course. It's impossible to, to start anywhere else because... Mm-hmm. You'll maybe get someone who's going to get you that first job, but who's going to get you your second, your third, your fourth job? True, true. Um, and so, yeah, but it was amazing on Skyfall because, like, yeah, it was my first feature. Mm-hmm. But now it's more special to me because it was the 50th anniversary film of James Bond. Right. And, and I just finished Star Trek Beyond, which was also the 50th anniversary film. So you've got two notches like, more. Two, exactly. Nice. For, so for me, it's very special. But I got to learn a lot because they, they put me into different departments there. Okay. So I got to build models. I, you know, I got to be with within the art department. Mm-hmm. I got to be on set. Um, next were you year. ever around the principal crew that were pre- in principal photography, or did you basically stay within the behind the scenes type stuff, where you're more developing the props and stage sets and you know? It different- was both. It okay. was both. So I had I had a few days. Um, in, in the construction shop, mm-hmm. a few days within the props, okay. a few days within uh, within the art department, so amongst okay. the art directors mm-hmm. and and uh, and the production designer, mm-hmm. and um, I had a couple of days on set during during principal photography. Okay, very yeah, cool. very cool. It was uh, next to Chris Lowe, who was the supervising art director. Oh, nice, nice, nice. And after that project, once that project was completed. <coughs> How did you go about seeking more opportunities? As you had just said, it's all about, you know, what was your last job? What was the contacts that you made? How yeah. how did you go about making, you know, you know, more of an impact within the industry? Because my understanding is you also, you're, you're based in Dubai. Yeah. But you also have your own production house, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, we've, yeah, it's recently launched. It's called Be Creative Productions. Right. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit more about that and what that focus is? Yeah, sure. Uh, so to answer your first question, um, it was it was actually a shame I could not stay for too long um, after Skyfall because okay. um, it was towards the end of my third year. And after that, they kind of changed the, the immigration laws there. And mm-hmm. so I had to leave and come back to Dubai. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in Dubai, again, it was just about, okay, what jobs are available? Uh, this is what I do within the art department. And then once people started seeing that, um, I could, you know, I could do stuff that a lot of people around this industry couldn't do. Right. Um, it was a matter of then getting your next job and your next job and your next job. Because my course, 
it was it's one of very few in the world that actually do it. Okay. Uh, so they're very focused on the art department. Start right. and so the skill set develops a lot. Uh, coming to my company in Dubai, um, we deal with everything from concept to edit and post production. Okay. So the full uh, the full spectrum basically from idea to when it's in the can basically. Yeah, and that's why it's called be creative. Uh, so nice. we, we even spell we spell it as B K R E A T I V, right. uh, and the whole idea being that no one in this company are called employees or whatever. Mm-hmm. We're, we we all consider ourselves creators, nice. right? Uh, and that's what everyone is. And so the idea of being able to conceptualize something and mm-hmm. take it all the way to the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that doesn't go to you know go to say we don't do other stuff. So people come in for edits and they say, look, we have a job. Can you do an edit for us? We do animation stuff, right. infographics, three um, D modeling. So you know two D design as well, right. uh, in terms of structures, facades, and you mm-hmm. know stuff like that. So it's being able to get creative in any way in mm-hmm. in the film or TV or motion motion picture industry. Right, right. Now. I've noticed within the last few decades, um, you know, industry has really shifted to where now the focus is more on Dubai and the Middle East as a, you know, a happening vivacious market for the industry in particular. And a lot of films in particular have been coming to places like Abu Dhabi, Dubai, you know, for photography and whatnot. I remember you stating that you also worked on one other film that came there. If you can tell the audience what that was... Oh, uh, that was Fast and Furious, Fast and Furious 7. Oh, that's spectacular. I mean, just... Yeah, little... that was in Abu Dhabi. Nice, very nice. Now, what was it, was your focus on that production? Um, what, what was your scope and how long did it take? And what were some of the difficulties that you faced with that film? Um, so it was... Uh, I had the same role like I did on Star Trek. So I was the assistant art director mm-hmm. for... For the Abu Dhabi location, mm-hmm. and um, it was dealing with a lot of uh, stuff that came in from LA. Okay. Um, it was dealing with uh, builds okay. in Abu Dhabi, so you know the stuff that we were building. Um, it was dealing with the art department on what the scale was over here with the mm-hmm. art director, mm-hmm. and uh, once the production designer came in, Bill Bretsky, um, following up with him with with stuff that he needed. So. You know, collecting samples, doing doing color colors. Like sure. we built some stuff in Abu Dhabi that was then sent to LA for them to put into a studio. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, so we had to match stuff. We had to match colors. We had to match uh, sand. We mm-hmm. believe it or not, they match sand color. Mm-hmm. Uh, they match the tar of the road. Uh, you know. Uh, I mean, there's, all, there's all about... a lot of footage out there of you know them shooting in and around the streets, and especially when they made the that amazing car jump through those three buildings and if i not were you in any way shape or form connected to that particular project when they made that i think it's the lycan sports car yeah the lycan yeah but that was not never done in dubai oh. uh, sorry in abu dhabi uh they actually did that all in on on a sound stage oh nice okay so you yeah like- so they managed to yeah they managed to recreate those elements and then they did one jump which second jump third jump um what what all they did in Abu Dhabi was everything around the Emirates Palace. Okay. Um, the uh, towards the end of the film, spoiler mm-hmm. alert, by the way. Sure. Uh, there towards the end of the film, when uh, the sun's going down, one of the characters is dying. Mm-hmm. All of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the cars driving into the Abu Dhabi city. So it was all of that stuff. It was a lot of more of the outdoor stuff rather than the yeah. indoor stuff. Right. Right. And yeah. how are some of the local industries i'm assuming because you're in the art department you're so invested into you know the different fabrics you you have to know where to supply carpet to work and you know all these different components that go into making these amazing sets or these amazing pieces how difficult or you know how easy is it to find the materials that you need i mean you know what it's not it depends what we need it for, and if it's stuff that's not available, we'll ship mm-hmm. it in. You know. Okay. True. True. Uh, and it's just like being in any part of the world. There's some right. stuff that you you just won't find. Right. Um, and then if you don't find it, you you get it in. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's yeah again, and sometimes you might find another way around it, which is the good learning curve, mm-hmm. where you want to use the material, but you can't find it, 
mm-hmm. and you might have to use something else to make it look like something else. Of course. So it's a matter of being uh, adaptable. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like okay, we need we need something like this. How do we how do we get something else and make it look like this? Mm-hmm. Or is there another way around it? And sometimes if it's going to cost too much to bring in, they'll just say, okay, we'll we'll, we'll change that part. I mean, right. if it's going to be that much of a trouble. Um, so yeah, you you find a way. That's why I said it's the biggest form of collaboration. Of it takes, you know, the, a big chunk of people to sit down and make that decision of, okay, let's do this since right. we cannot do that. Right. Now, um, for the students out there and the amateur market, with regards to people who are interested with getting into the art industry or the, you know, becoming an art director and, you know, gaining experience through that, what are some of the best practices or positive motivations that you can give to those that are just starting out? Specifically for the art department? Mm-hmm. Uh, learning how to draw, I think, is very important. Okay, so concept art. Yeah, no, honestly, no. Not doing amazing concept art, right? Mm-hmm. So my production designer on Skyfall, mm-hmm. um, and I was in uni that time, right? So I went and asked him, I said, will you look at some of my stuff and mm-hmm. tell me if it's good or bad or what I should change. You know, I'm just, I was there to learn, get advice. Right. Uh, and he saw it, and then before he could even go through all it, he said, actually, I don't want to see it. And he's like, I don't care if it looks amazing. I, I believe you can do amazing work. Uh-huh. But I don't care if it looks amazing. Uh, I care about getting the job done. Okay. And so- he said, when I when he had met Sam Mendes years back, mm-hmm. he Sam Mendes, the, the, the director, he, uh-huh. he didn't know how to read plans and he he showed me he's like, so I drew a little doodle and uh-huh. explained to him that this is how this is how you know you read a plan. And he said, okay. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you do the best looking work or not. It's okay. what is gonna work. Of course. Can people understand it? If your department can understand a doodle, mm-hmm. why are you gonna spend four hours doing exactly. something amazing? So, like when I said, so when I said learning how to draw for an, for the art department mm-hmm. was specifically learning how to to get what is up there down on paper and conveying can, them. exactly, uh, and then having skills like you know different like computer skills are pretty pretty important nowadays. Um, so, moving and learning different skills mm-hmm. like you know Photoshop. Um, 3D Studio Max used to be big for, uh, but now there's a software called Rhino, Rhinoceros. Right. It's a lot of people are moving onto it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's actually pretty powerful. Um, I haven't got my hands completely on it because mm-hmm. I just, you know, I find different ways how to do it. I'll start with Sketch and build it in in a SketchUp model and render it using different rendering engines and right. Photoshop. So again, it's different ways what works for people. But uh, the best way to get mm-hmm. into film. Mm-hmm. Art departments is as a draftsman. Okay. It's the best way to get in. Um, draftsmen are always needed. Because they are the multitask handyman, basically, to where they can, you know, build and construct and, you know, do whatever you ask, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but not really as well. It's the, the, They're the guys who are going to sit down there and do those technical drawings for you. Of course. And there are not many people who do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the ones with that much experience mm-hmm. don't want to be the junior draftsman. Okay. They don't want to be told, okay, we need to do a detail for a door hinge. So True. sit down and do the detail of, you know, where the screw is going to go, you know, mm-hmm. the size and all that. Because the guys who know how to do it have so much more experience that they're doing the whole set. Sure, sure. And then your junior draftsman is doing all those little details. And back in the day, they used to do it by hand, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now yeah. they just use the computer for it. There was this other element that I wanted to ask you about when you're designing sets or props, um, you know, because you are filming it from a particular angle and you're using extremely expensive cameras, digital cameras that require certain lighting and whatnot. And, you know, these sets, these big props have to be moved easily in and around. What form, you know, how much homework goes into the development of, say, your your next film, the most recent picture that you worked on, which is, which was Star Trek. Star, Star Trek Beyond, yeah. Nice. Now let me ask you: Were you the genius behind designing the bridge? No, 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 no. Uh, that was uh, well. The whole genius behind the film was Mr. Tom Sanders. Okay. He's the he's the production designer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and honestly, he 
he did such an incredible, amazing job with it. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. And there were so many other art directors and stuff on it, right? Um, I was involved with doing the graphics for all the stuff that was shot in Dubai. Okay. Um, and then uh, dealing with some of the sets and the builds mm -hmm. uh, and everything that we were building within the stage. Right. But uh, when you're moving big stuff around, mm -hmm. generally your art director uh, has already thought it through and he okay. knows what is going to be shot where. Okay. And you have it on wheels. So we had everything on wheels. We made like little trolleys for these big sets and, you mm -hmm. know, they were on wheels. And if not, if it, if it cannot move, uh, like we did, we had a set that was tons. It was like eight tons or something like that, mm -hmm. and a tank. And then it just sat there. They, you know, the special effects guys, they made a whole rig for it. Mm -hmm. It sat there, and that that can't move. Okay, great. Now, uh, shifting focus, uh, basically, for more the student market out there and everything. Dubai seems like a up and coming market and whatnot, but our focus primarily is trying to cultivate a similar you know, establishment or artistic creative artistic creativity within Qatar. You've done some projects here in Doha. And mm -hmm. do you, you know, ever see yourself maybe coming back and, you know, cultivating something similar to what you've done in Dubai, but here in Qatar? Yeah, I mean, you know what? Oh, I'm never going to say no to good, good work. Mm -hmm. um, however... I mean, in all honesty, working in Doha was a bit difficult. Okay. What were some of the difficulties that you came across in versus... Infrastructure, you know? Uh, finding stuff sometimes becomes mm -hmm. just really, really, really difficult. I mean, it could be simple things. Mm -hmm. Like I remember once we were looking for a leaf blower. Okay. Uh, and we were looking for a leaf blower that was not, you know, normal. It was not the Makita one. Uh, that you get that's battery operated, but rather the one you know the two stroke one. Sure. The and this was a this was a couple of years back, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just spent the whole day looking for it, and then we got it down from Dubai. Oh, uh, of course. Yeah, that that's unfortunate because Doha's industry is still very young, and I think they're it's fixed. growing. It's growing. And, but, you know the good part though. The good part about Doha is there's there's so much space, there's so much opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, and the competition's so little. Of so course. the guys, the guys who want to do it now, there, mm -hmm. they have, they have everything, you know. Like Dubai's, it's grown so much, mm -hmm. uh, so the competition is so much more. Right, right. And Doha has the edge and the advantage in terms of, they have, they have, they have the backing. Okay. And and if they get, if they get the support, you know, be it government or the film guys or you know, like stuff like what you what you guys are doing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they get supported where getting the right crew together. Of course. And, uh, and if they're willing to actually take in that saying, okay, this is the stuff we can do, the stuff mm -hmm. we can't do, get it in, get it in from somewhere else. Right. And, uh, and then eventually the guys who are there will start learning about what the stuff is coming in from outside. Right. Experience so, and exposure, basically. Exactly. Is, exactly. Is and they'll, start, they'll start learning how to do it. And maybe now they're charging like double, but eventually they'll learn how to do it for a cheaper price. And of then course. they'll be the, guy, the go to guys for everyone to say, oh, if you're going to Doha, you know, you want something, go to these guys. Right, right. Okay, great. One last question before we end this second podcast on QFS. First, uh, thank you so very, very much for joining us. You're an industry expert with regards to our students and amateurs, and we will most definitely have you back on the show. Thanks, um, man. Thanks for having me. It's, you're uh, most welcome. It was great for you to get in touch. Of course. Let me ask you one final question before you go. Do you have any big productions coming up? Something that you can share with the audience out there? I mean, is anything that, you know, maybe we can get some amateurs, you know, invested in or some students that want to get, you know. Oh, hey, listen, I have I have my feature film. That's right now the biggest thing in my pipeline. OK. Uh, and like I said, uh, it's been a lot that's gone into it. Mm -hmm. uh, blood, sweat, and tears, money, all of it. Uh, you can actually watch a teaser for it I shot last year on YouTube. It's called Elixir of Life. Okay, great. We will make sure to yeah. link that to our page and promote it as best we can. Hey, thanks, man. You're most welcome, bro. Thank you so very much for joining us. And thanks, as always, thanks a lot, Derek. Thanks. I'll speak to you soon, yeah? Of course. Have a good night. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.